much, uh, John and Ken, um, and thanks to, to Alan and, and Mike for giving us a, a start here today. What I want to do is take some of the words that Mike just talked about in terms of imaging reservoirs and tell you where we're actually going in terms of uncovering. Some of the people in the room will be familiar with what Uncover is, and some of them not, but Uncover is a large initiative that's aimed at addressing essentially this shortfall in our ability to target largely grassroots uh, undercover. And I've, I've got two hats to wear today. Um, one is as the chair and uh, in charge of Geoscience for Uncover, which is a collaborative initiative between government uh, academia and industry, and I'm also the uh, the chief at First Quantum, so an industry and an academic perspective. Um, I can show lots of versions of this, so we'll probably skip through. But we all know the discovery rates are declining. This is uh, sediment hosted copper systems. The last grassroots discovery was in 1974 in Afghanistan. The only deep success for sedimentary copper is at Zaman Aga in Kazakhstan, only under 150 meters. It's an immediate call to arms for the room as to why perhaps the best undercover base metal deposit style that we could possibly do economically is such a poor discovery record at depth. And it's got a lot to do with the lack of geophysical direct detection. This is a deposit style that we're simply challenged in terms of hunting for bumps. And that's what this day is all about. So this is a first quantum project, a real one, in Botswana, it could be in Australia. There's a small part of our crop here, and Gavin himself is going to tell us a little bit more about this later on today. And the key question is, what do we do next? There's virtually no outcrop to look at, and you can see the scale here. Large grassroots initiative looking for a deposit style with no direct geophysical detection method. And so the central hypothesis for Uncover goes a little bit like this. What if undercover exploration demands a different exploration workflow than explorers have used today? What if it isn't a simple extrapolation of the way we've been working? And you've already got a flavour of that this morning, and one of the short answers I will say is we are chasing not the bumps, because we won't get anywhere near the bumps. We are chasing the reservoirs. That's what it's all about. And I'm going to show you, I was one of the authors of some of those diagrams that Mike put up. The reason for it is simply the scale that we have to work at and the quality of the data sets we're going to work at. And we need to focus on that reservoir rather than on the, the mineral system itself, rather than on the deposit. So what I'll do is talk about undercover exploration is today. What does good practice look like today? And I don't want to be arrogant and suggest that first quantum is good practice, but I'm going to show you some examples from my understanding from Uncover of what good practice looks like at the moment. What do we already know how to do? There's an awful lot that we need to normalize. The industry is actually very regular in its knowledge base. A lot of the stuff that we're hearing, some people have been working in for 20 years. The mineral systems have been around for 20 years. Some people have been using mineral systems and targeting for 20 years. So what we've got to do is normalize that. And Alan already alluded to that. There are other industries that are doing their best to normalize the baseline in order to take the next step. If we accept this opening point here, that is an enormous step. And as Alan has showed us, Australia must take the step for simple economic reasons. The rest of the world, you could argue, doesn't. But from an Australian perspective, from a government perspective, the numbers are quite startling. We have to make this step. And then I'm going to be bold, or at least I'm going to throw out to the audience a call to arms as to what undercover exploration might look like in 15 years' time. What are we going to have to do to get to those sort of points, to be able to achieve the uncover vision, which is to be as good as explorers at the undercover as we are at the surface today. And that statement should be met with almost horror if we think about our current exploration abilities at the surface from the sort of statistics we see from the likes of Richard. Show you. But let's not forget that companies have been here before and tried to do this. There's obviously the Olympic Dam, but my favourite example of a successful example of undercover exploration is Cannington. Because BHP set out to find a deposit style that was considered rare. They went on a global hunt, they put the innovation together, they recognised the bump hunting, they recognised the direct detection capability, but they recognised the mineral system. And they did it in the 1990s. And they only stopped because they were successful. 
This is what everyone says they're trying to do, and they actually did it. And so we shouldn't forget that there are areas and pockets of expertise of people who have been truly successful in the past. So what does exploration look like in 2015? I think a lot of companies do have this kind of perspective, like Cannington, where they've gone out and developed this understanding of new techniques, new directed te techniques, new geophysical imagery techniques and reservoirs, and try to take on this sort of problem in Botswana and using different workflows. This is our guys in Botswana sampling water. Why? Because it's the only geochemical media that we're going to see under significant cover. It is the only geochemical media. If we're going to combine geophysics and geophysics, geochemical techniques, then we're going to actually have to break through in a technique like this. In some like First Quantum, we've done seven regional surveys in 2014 alone because we must solve these issues if we're going to be good at undercover exploration. So what is different to surface exploration? In very simplistic terms, grassroots rather than brownfields, and this is important because the difference is rather marked into how we would do undercover exploration. We have to start from the outside and move in. Now, all exploration is a basically sequential volume reduction. We all know that, but you know what? Practically, that's not the case. In most cases, in a grassroots environment, most grassfield projects start in and around with physical, tangible rocks and most explorers today still do this. You go back to 1975 and Western Mining and Olympic Dam and that's not the case. But the majority are still. It's a psychological issue. We still start with the bird in the hand. Most people would rather start with mineralization in their hand than a source reservoir that had perfect characteristics of a mineral system. That's the mental step that we're going to have to make. We find the far field footprint, the reservoir, way before we find the mineralization. And in fact, advances in drilling techniques and advances in just straight, straight out uh, drilling full stop means we're likely to find the mineralization if we have confidence in the system in the first place. But as John alluded to, the implications are upfront expenditure is going to be higher. I'd like to challenge maybe his point that expenditure will be higher, but upfront expenditure will look higher. And we've got tangible experience for that we're going to find that we're going to have to invest early on in data sets, geophysical data sets, and stratigraphic drilling that isn't target testing. It's still drilling, but it's just the collection of the sample media that you want. And that's going to make expenditure look out of whack relative to traditional exploration. And this is important because we all work for mining companies that in the end are going to compare with surface exploration. Results are going to come slower as well because we're going to have a lot of early stage work that's just going to be establishing the patterns. And yet these projects are going to have to compare with projects in other parts of the world. You cannot misunderstand the significance of this problem. In the end, a mining company can go to Chile. A mining company can go to Kazakhstan, and they do not have to explore in Australia. So the challenge for Australia is to become better at undercover exploration in order to delay expenditure going overseas. That's the bigger problem, rather than just becoming better explorers. Undercolor exploration is a bit like exploring a, a donor, and the jam middle part is missing. So if you take a porphyry middle, I'm going to take everything that you think is important about the porphyry, and I'm going to remove it. I'm going to take the whole middle part out of it. All those characteristics. And quite simply, we like jam. I'm a geologist. We have a history of being focused in and around the deposit model that we're interested in. And now we're going to have to remove that, or at least partially remove it, from what we're trying to do. So what's uncover? I don't know how many people in the room can cover. I thought I'd come along today and sort of allude to what it is. It is a government initiative. It, this is a call to arms. It's not necessarily restricted to Australia. It's Australian focus, but it's very much relevant to a Canadian perspective, for example, as well. Established in 2010 by the Australian Academy of Science, it's a large scientific research strategy. It's pulling together government, it's pulling together industry, and it's pulling together academia, and it's trying to do it on a scale that hasn't been achieved before. Now, some of you have been around the industry for probably a little longer will probably uh, raise your eyebrows at that because we've heard these words before. But this is the challenge that we're putting out. It is 
this vision is remarkably difficult to put in place across this industry and almost impossible, it would seem, to achieve. But we must. And if we must, therefore, we must find ways around that particular issue. So this is Uncover. Oops, that's a bit out of whack. So this is uh, the themes for Uncover. Four broad themes under a mineral systems approach. So a lot of industries have been working for 20 years in mineral systems. It's quite mature in its understanding. And we're seeing a lot of this published now in the, in the international literature. But a lot of industries have already been working in mineral systems. So we're relatively mature in what we think we want to know. And these are the four themes that we've been working on. One is characterizing the cover. The first step that most people think of when they think of characterizing the cover is tell me the depth to the target I'm looking for. That's so correct and also so defeatist. You're immediately thinking of removal of search space instead of eyes lifting up and looking for the cover. The cover is the footprint that we're looking for and not just the depth of the cover but the geometry of the cover is going to become our key targeting medium. Lithospheric structure. Lots of people telling us about how important lithospheric structure is. I don't want to duplicate what Mike showed us. But quite simply, without lithospheric structure, we can't get quality addresses. But if we're going to leave it at that, and we don't solve the gap footprint to get between here and the ore body itself, then it becomes of academic interest. And that's actually where we're stuck. We've been working on imagery of lithospheric structures for 20 years, and we're stuck. And the reason we're stuck isn't the quality of this work. It's the quality of the work in the scale that comes down. It's the quality of the connecting work between that and the ore body. 4D metallogenesis, it's obvious, and the distal footprints themselves. The donut, not the jam, within the donut. Um, fancy diagram that really just shows an attempt to try and bring together everyone. We have all the state surveys and GA, CSRO, um, the Australian Academy of Science, the government, and we've only just started, would you believe, pulling industry together. In fact, one of the weaknesses I've uncovered before, so far, is that industry hasn't been necessarily central to the party. So collaboration, haven't I heard that before, but now the initiative is essentially switching around to being company-led, and we're in the middle of, of a road mapping exercise, much like the deep CRC went through, in order to get a government, a company, and an academic perspective. It's very crucial from a point of view from, uh, from Canberra that this is led by industry or at least represents truly what industry wants. And we have other industries that are doing this. And Alan has uh, alluded to something that Cam and I have been discussing for a long period of time. If you've seen what's happened in the human genome in the last 10 years. 10 years ago it cost a billion dollars to develop the human genome. I did mine for $99 online last week. Okay? The advances that were required are the largest in scientific history to make that. The largest advances in fundamental science, the largest advances in the transfer and technology that's required to bring it online, and the largest breakthroughs in IP management that we've ever seen. And they did it because they had to. The other one that we've actually seen, some of you may have heard me talk about it before, is the search, NASA's search for exoplanets. And we're doing it not just with a step change and a real meaning of the word step change in terms of paradigm shifting, but also new collaboration models. We are trying to form new models. Undercover exploration is not simply an extrapolation of what we're currently doing. If we believe that, then we will make only incremental advances and we will not drive the changes that are required. So where's Uncover up at the moment? We're in the middle of a road mapping exercise led by Robbie Rowe, ex Barrick. Uh, that concludes tomorrow for those who are a sponsor of it of that meeting. Um, and that's really getting the industry viewpoint because industry is going to have to lead this initiative. Governments, meanwhile, are on their way. They've been charging along for quite some time on this initiative, looking at depth to cover maps. We're going to see GA's recent uh, rollout and a new initiative for depth of cover across the whole of the country. Uh, stratigraphic, new approaches to stratigraphic drilling for the state surveys, um, things like Demitra in South Australia, which are really coming up with variants on the PACE scheme, co-funded drilling schemes that are looking at mineral systems, drilling the reservoir, not drilling 
the deposit. So shared funding for drilling the reservoir, not for drilling the actual direct detection itself. This is a huge step uh, for government initiatives. So let's just go through those four initiatives, characterising the cover. And this is my pitch today to a room of largely geophysicists. We need to know more than the depth of the basement. Cover is actually the key. Steve Hill from Demita actually says we need to be cover lovers. We drill holes, and the first thing we do is look at the basement intersection or at the unconformity instead of looking at the cover itself. So, as a geophysicist or as a geologist, what do I want to know? I don't want to know the depth of the cover, that's defeatist. I want to know the geometry of the unconformity surface. I want to image the geophysical sur that surface geophysically as early as possible and as accurately as possible. Why? Because it's my starting point. I'm going to base every technique that I can possibly think of, me personally, off that unconformity. Long before I do anything else. Here's some work we're doing with Ravi Anand at the moment along unconformity surfaces. And you will have seen some cool work come out of South Australian surveys above the likes of Olympic Dam and that. But along that particular unconformity, if I can image that surface, I can plan stratigraphic drilling. I'm going to plan stratigraphic drilling based on the geometry of that surface. How accurately I can do that then is going to be depend on what I do along that unconformity surface, what I sample along that unconformity surface. Eyes up, not looking at the surface below. I'm just going to look along that unconformity surface. I'm going to make a geological map based on the mineralogy I get from that unconformity. We could already do it. We could already do examples. Here's some examples from Wind First Quantum here of looking at coin scan along uh, interface samples and trying to image what the minerals are and extrapolate to the rock type based on a small sample collection. And then using the rapid field scan mode for quen scan and trying to identify if any of these contain sulfides. Because one of the things that's important about understanding that conformity is the first thing I want to know is the geometry. The second thing I want to know is its dispersion characteristics, its geochemical dispersion. Hydromorphic versus mechanical. Mechanical is related to topography. And I'm going to be able to assess that very, very early on in the piece. And I'm going to be able to base everything that I do in terms of geochemistry or mineralogy as a result. I'm going to be able to create the geological map of tomorrow if I can accurately map that geometry. And there are groups, obviously, around Australia that are already working on this. So that's mapping the cover. The second one is lithospheric architecture. And I've been involved in working with lithospheric architecture stuff for, for 10, 15 years myself. The most important thing, and I think Mike really alluded to this, and here's just other techniques using near denim isotopes, but it could be geophysical data sets. We need more data, of course, but more importantly, we need more interrogation and science around the data. There, aren't enough, there isn't enough rigour in this particular area of the science at this moment in time, and that's really the main area of focus going forward. 4D metallogenesis. It's more than dating ore deposits. Again, we've got to turn around and use the technology we can to go forward. Dating ore bodies is an academic fact, fact that's almost afterwards. We need to think about what geochronology can do. The first thing we can do is establish causality. <coughs> Take rigor, bring rigor into targeting elements. The really big one for geophysics in particular is the delineation of transient events. As Mike alluded to, in the mineral systems concept, essentially we have reservoirs and for most ore systems, the release from that reservoir is a small temporal moment that ends up with a manifestation and data sets. And I think I might have put a slide in, but we can take a nickel context. It ends up releasing a suite of magmatic intrusions that have the same chemistry, the same geophysical characteristics, the same prospectivity, but it represents a small moment in time in a larger time slot. As we evolve, geochronology, we're able to do this. But the reality is we are never going to be effective at using geochronology as an exploration target tool. We're going to need geophysical proxies for these features. And that's going to be one of my last points, is about data resolution. It's about, we do not need to necessarily re exact, represent exactly what we're trying to do. We need proxies for what we're trying to do. And geophysics is going to have to be central. Uh, this is an example from Run doing that. And the last one is distal footprint. This is the one that every explorer tells you they're wrong. What they're really saying is they want to be able to see their deposit at wider and wider areas. So it means different things to different people, and especially in a brownfield environment, 
distal footprint really usually means sometime in and around the footprint itself. But in a grassroots environment, it actually means the tangible manifestation of the mineral system. It's the manifestation of the cluster of all systems, the manifestation of the camp, if you like, from an economic perspective. And that tangible manifestation is the reservoir. And there are lots of examples I could show, and I just threw a few in today because I know there's a lot more qualified people than me, starting with Eric next, to show examples of people doing this. But we have been doing this for 20 years. So the first one is take sedimentary hosted systems. This is the footprint of sediment hosted ore systems. You can see Lubin here. Uh, here's a scale down here in 10 kilometers. Huge footprint systems with no direct detection. But what we can do is start looking for geophysical proxies of the ore reservoirs. This is our undercover success of Zaman Ada here in Kazakhstan. And now we're looking at the alteration imaging, the alteration system, which you can see in the hatch along this antiform structure, sinform structure uh, in here. We're not trying to image the ore body, we're trying to image, in this case, the conversion of hematitic redstones to magnetite, that reduction process with the mineral mush divide, which some of you will know from the IOCG systems. So we're imaging essentially the reduction alteration system as the footprint itself, as a starting point. And this is a discovery from 1981, and this is actually how they did this. They weren't looking for the ore body, they were looking for the alteration system. Here's some lovely examples from different people around. I could throw some Eric's in, but he's going to talk next. From Nickel here, Luis Pellerin looking at staging chambers under Nickel systems and in uh, MT here and then, and then gravity in the bottom. And lots of examples here, <coughs> combining seismic and MT here, trying to image uh, reservoirs uh, under Agua Blanca in Spain. And obviously a very famous example now in the porphyry system. The important thing to understand about both the nickel systems and the porphyry and magmatic systems is the diagrams we drew, the white diagrams that have been shown this morning, of what a porphyry backlith looks like. That's the part we got wrong to start with. Porphyry backliths don't look like that. And that's going to be important for the geophysical imagery. They're not equidimensional. And it's important that we understand what batholiths and source reservoirs look like. And that's where the science is going to come in before we get the geophysical uh, imagery right for trying to look at what's underneath, in this case, uh, being in canyon. So here's a mineral system. I'll show one. This is nickel sulfides. Uh, along here is the source pathway trap uh, that we're all familiar with for a mineral system. Down here is scale. The really important point that Mike's already alluded to, we're actually really quite good at this. And we're very good at this. This is the deposit, and orange are the really important things. You'll see them trending across the board. This is what we're not good at, and it's the same for every mineral system. We're not good at it because that diagram that Mike showed has a crossover between our ability to detect something and our ability to protect something, predict something, and it's a crossover at scale. And that scale corresponds with no data or poor data resolution. Down here, we solve the problem, and we will continue as an industry to solve the problem. So we have to focus on doing two things. One is new science that fits in this area in here, this, this scale, or taking things at this scale and this scale and driving them into the middle of the diagram. So I'll just show you one example of something that we've been doing, which is trying to image something here and here. Now to do that, I'm going to have to have trade-offs in how representative of what I'm looking at. And I'm also going to have to have trade-offs in the rigor of the science, necessarily, of what I'm about to image. So this is the important thing to realize. We have to focus on the scale that impacts the most, not the problems that, are, that we can do, but the problems that we can't do. And that's actually not how things work. This is called the theory of constraints. We've got to fix the problems that are stopping us from doing this. No, no matter how good I am... About five minutes, Steve. Sure. No matter how good I am at imaging lithospheric architecture, I will never find an ore body unless I can cross this scale. I'll lay that statement straight out. We cannot work only at this scale. Likewise, under cover, we cannot work on the deposit footprint and expect to find large scale ore bodies unless we can see their manifestations at scales in between. That sounds really obvious, but 90% of the science is in here and 10% of the science is in here and no science in here. So I'll give one example that I'm familiar with. There are 660 papers on commodity hosted nickel sulfide systems, and there's one in this space. 
So from an academic perspective, it gives you an idea. Let's take uh, nickel sulfide as an example. Here's a critical process that intrusions are hosted in these tiny little uh, ore bodies, these tiny little intrusions we call chonolus, and here they are in cross-section. Note the scale. Intimidating scale. So let's, if these are so damn important, and people like me stand up and say they're so damn important, why can't we image them? Well, this is a room of geophysics. First problem is going to be data density. How am I going to see these if the data density is relatively low? Well, the first thing is just to start to understand synthetically what they look like. Here's some work we did with Amanda Buckingham, really trying to look at all the single processes that get in our way. One of the problems in here is obviously data density, but actually the biggest one we face on a daily basis is magnetic remnants. It's by far the thing that stops me trying to image something with a pipe-like geometry using magnetic data alone. So the mineral scale problem is not going to solve itself. This slide is in jest, but it's a lot closer to reality than we would like. We are not good at this particular scale of mineral exploration, and we are not good at this particular scale of research. And that's what we have to do going forward. So what does mineral exploration look like in 2030? And apologies if this sounds at all bold, it's not. It's really designed to stir up the room and encourage your physicists to get involved. Because like John said yesterday, or the day before, um, geophysics is, going to, is actually going to play the central role going forward in understanding this mineral systems under cover. So everyone will focus around area selection, will focus their area selection around quality of the address, the sort of things that Mike was alluding to. But, and importantly, we won't leave science there, because we can already see that we can be probably good at that type of science. We will actually map the target horizon cover of conformity, and we will try to image it. That's a geophysical problem. That is 100% a geophysical problem. We're actually going to build derivative geological maps. How we plan our stratigraphic holes? We can't do undercover exploration without stratigraphic drilling. But at the moment, how we choose to do stratigraphic drilling is very poor. We can actually, as a result of these unconformities, understand belt scale fertility from small subset samples because we can understand the geometric context that we're trying to put things in. And so this will enable us to connect things like mineral chemistry, which seemingly is this scale, obviously, microscale, new techniques under cover like hydrogen chemistry, where we actually already have the technology, and geophysical imagery, and connect them together. And lastly, that we will explore for the tangible footprint of the mineral system, not for the deposits themselves, because the deposits and the bumps will come. They will evolve as we come into the exploration process. And so uh, this is another word of saying, stand in front of a group of geophysicists and tell them how to suck eggs. Teaching birds on how to fly, if any of you have ever read anything from uh, Nicholas Taleb. Imaging the tangible manifestation of the mineral system is the key for geophysics going forward. Staging chambers, the exhausts of fluids as they leave, we can recognize the sedimentary systems of how we leave, fluids leave. And here's my favorite one, visualization of uncertainty. Inversions. Don't tell me that there's a model. Show me the range of model percentages and make it easy as a geologist for me to image and understand the variations in model possibilities. So that's not actually a technical problem, that's a visualization problem and the one I've already met, is imagery of non-conformity services. And I threw the last one in for Ken's benefit, because 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we said it was really important that we integrated geology and geophysics, and we're still having the same conversation. Thank you very much for your time. I do like the one about the multiple models, and Mark Jessel was talking about that yesterday as well in his presentation about the, in part, the uh, uh, way to get geology engaged. I find that if we, we have a couple of geologists working for us now, and I think they find it very frustrating if we just give them a solution, because it's sort of, it's very difficult for them to engage saying, well, I have to work my geological thinking around the idea that there's just one geophysical reality, whereas, in fact, we know there's multiple ones. It's either a question of 
the methodologies we're lose, uh, using or the time we have available, we say, yeah, sure, we, if we change the sensitivity matrix, we could have a, quite a different one. And one of the big things we get involved with is, is argy-bargy discussions about, for a number of you probably know about the, the UVC code, and John Payne's got one, and there's probably some other ones, but the UVC codes tend to have this thing we call tree trunks. It tends to want to put everything as, as sub-vertical bodies, and that's just part of the original, call it the genome of, of, the, of, of the algorithm. And there are ways, that if you have, particularly if you have some constraint of bending that around, the geophysicists tend not to want to do that because it implies that they're introducing some, some bias, which they don't really have ownership of. The geologist usually has maybe not explicit ownership, but they have probably a gut feel for what would make sense. And this is something where, you know, I think maybe in, in, in the world that maybe Mark will think of in 20 years is we'll have algorithms that actually have underlying uh, software that actually mimics in kind of a neural network sense what we would think about those things. And we can actually produce, you know, looking at geophysical data sets, we can actually ge generate models that look a lot more like geology than they do now. Right now, we still have to sit down and work to collaboratively to come up with those things, and it takes time. So, but in the, in the meantime, have, is there any way, I mean, how many, the way we've developed a geophysical model is that there's a lot of outsourcing, essentially, which encourages the passing back of single models right. instead of iteration. So we're losing iteration from the workflow process. And as a result, geologists don't have the skills necessarily to interpret this work. But it, there isn't that lack of interaction to encourage that interpretation. And it isn't about geologists not knowing what they're doing. It's about getting a variant or variations of themes and testing different variations right. of the theme. That's what really matters. Yeah. Well, look, one of the things we've had as a discussion with some colleagues is, is the role of forward solutions in this process. And it, it's kind of a lost art. Juf is, is regarded as fairly dorky these days uh, because it's so simple. That's gen generally taking a geometric concept, geological model, and just generating what a potential field or electric field or whatever would look like, and examining that and thinking about that. Is something detectable? What's the effect of cover? What's the effect of depth? What's the effect of geometry? Forget about the inversion. Just in your mind's eye, come away with an idea. Is that actually detectable in the data? And then you've got, you empower yourself or you've allowed yourself to be calibrated in a way which is very explicit. Uh, but it's, it's something we uh, workshopped a couple of years ago in Vancouver. We sort of reintroduced this concept. And the, I think that, you know, there's no problem. The software's been out there for 40 years to do these things. And it's quite easy, but it's actually something that's not used much. But in a conversation, between, say, the geophysicist who's planning a survey with a geologist and maybe a geochemist and say, what are the actual parameters we're working with here? What's going to be the effect of it? Uh, you know, varying depth and target size and things like that. It's quite quite effective. If we take the, the Cholent example. Increasingly now, I, I took ASX releases. I'll find Cholent, magnetic inversions of Cholent turning up every week. In fact, there's 50 of them in the world. So you can tell them you immediately have created a false positive problem now because people want to see something in data sets. And so what we've got to do for make all body discoveries is we've got to falsify that hypothesis in some ways by saying, tell me what it can't be rather than tell me what it can, it can be. Is it possible that this could be imaged in this data set? And that's going to be important for the ore reservoir situation as well. There's a lot of ways to interpret magnetic and gravity data for these features the question is, what can we actually test it? Maybe we turn that question around and say, what can't it be? Is there nothing here? Is that permissive? Can we explain this by other physical processes? Because um, otherwise we're going to end up in the situation of overplaying these examples. If you want to show a nice tubular looking intrusion, it doesn't appear to be that difficult to be able to do that. And yet, the implications and meaning are quite large. Yeah, that's kind of the, the analogy in the, in the theatres these days is that turning the enigma thing. Yeah. Eliminate the impossible, and what's left is actually the things you should think about. So, anyways, thanks, Steve.